Hello and welcome to the University of Nottingham. I'm joined today by Professor William Kay, who is the Professor of Theology at Glyndewa University. It's a great pleasure to welcome you here today. And uh, William is an expert on Pentecostalism. And in this film, we are going to uh, talk a bit about Pentecostal theology. So William, would you like to start by outlining um, the Pentecostal theology the, uh, in summary to us? Right. Well, of course, originally Pentecostals were accused of having no theology whatsoever and being a kind of theology-free zone. Um, in fact, Pentecostals will sometimes say um, the person with an experience is not at the mercy of the person with an argument. So the Pentecostals would emphasize experience and de-emphasize uh, doctrine. But actually, there is a Pentecostal theology. I mean, perhaps there's more than one. And I would say that central to Pentecostal theology would be a, a, a belief in a, a spiritual experience called baptism in the Holy Spirit. Baptism in the Holy Spirit. So for, as a post-conversion experience. So Pentecostal theology would be uh, in a sense, uh, similar to evangelical theology, that there is a moment of regeneration, based on John 3, uh, justification, and that this time of regeneration, or new birth, uh, is then followed uh, sometime later, not for long, by a baptism in the Spirit. So this, this, this phrase, baptism in the Spirit, uh, understood in New Testament terms, um, in comparison to the baptism of John in Jordan. So an immersion in the Spirit, a sense of the Holy Spirit being poured out on the individual. And funny enough, the reference to Jesus as the baptizer in the Spirit is one of the few texts that occurs in all four Gospels. And then uh, this is followed in the Book of Acts by the conversation between the risen Christ and the disciples. Uh, you will be, be baptized in the Spirit and Acts 2 on the day of Pentecost is this baptism in the Spirit. So hence Pentecostals, they call themselves Pentecostals because of this, yeah, this connection with Acts that's the key Acts text, two. presumably, Acts 2. It's a t key text. Mm. And, and the, the text is that the, the, the church, as it then exists, 120 people, are, are this small band of people, Christians, are waiting in an upper room and suddenly the Spirit falls upon them and there's a, a vision of, you see, fire and then they're filled with the Spirit and then they all speak in tongues, not just the apostles but everybody. It's a communal experience but also individual and this, this then leads to them going out onto the streets of Jerusalem and preaching. So it's from the experience that they then go and confront the hostile city of Jerusalem. Right, so is baptism in the Spirit a one-off experience, like baptism with water? Um, well, in theory it, it, it is, but also there are references in Acts to being filled with the Spirit again. So in Acts 4, the disciples are all filled with the Spirit again. So in, in the actual baptism might be a singular experience, but then there might be subsequent refilling. So that's how most Pentecostals would see this. Right. Okay, and what, um, what other features of Pentecostal theology would you want to draw our attention to? Well, I, I would say that the consequence of belief in baptism in the Spirit is really twofold. Firstly, into mission, and secondly, into ecclesiology. Mm -hmm. So in terms of mission, <coughs> Pentecostals felt that they were, as it were, obedient to the missionary spirit of the Holy Spirit. So they would see the Holy Spirit as kind of driving forward mission. The Spirit is given in order that mission might occur. So from the very beginning, Pentecostals were keen to get out from the walls of, behind the walls of the church and into the world and to preach the gospel. So that, that's really a characteristic. I mean, from the Azusa Street Revival, they go off to China and India. Um, speaking in tongues and it's assuming the people in those countries will understand them when they speak in tongues, which they don't. Mm -hmm. But but they, they go out, you know, burning their bridges, a one-way ticket, and off they go. So there's a huge belief that, yeah, we've got the answer, and that the Spirit is poured out for the sake of the world and for the sake of the harvest. This, there's, there's a kind of belief that the Spirit is given in order that the church might grow. So there's a, a, a very strong belief in mission. And then within the church, the belief in the individual empowerment by the Spirit leads to a different ecclesiology because you have all the people in the congregation who are in some way expected to participate. 
So you kind of break down the, the laity clergy division mm -hmm. because you've got now a, a congregation of 100 people and everybody believes they've received the Holy Spirit, so everybody can contribute. So you, you end up with a very active congregation, not a, a passive congregation is all in a, going through a liturgical process, but a, an active congregation where everybody is bursting to do something and say something. Theologically, they may all be going off in different directions, presumably, if they're feeling that they've been inspired in particular ways they, that they are may, in contradiction. They, they perhaps they often did, and, and, and Pentecostalism often was the fissiparous. I mean, they were, you know, they broke up and went in different directions, and, and there were arguments and misunderstandings. So, th but it, there was also energy. And, and, and sometimes the splits in churches led to new congregations being formed. So there's, there's huge energy, but also um, there is a kind of misunderstanding perhaps of doctrine and uh, to perhaps a danger of belief in kind of private revelation which supersedes all other tradition. Mm. So this, this actually is one of the first, uh, first kinds of problems that arises in Pentecostalism. What do you do with the individual who claims to have received a revelation, but that revelation appears to be really quite out of the ballpark? I mean, a revelation that doesn't make any sense according to the 20 centuries that have preceded. So this kind of conflict between tradition and new revelation does occur and, um, and has to be confronted and, and somehow dealt with. Mm. And the issue of speaking in tongues, um, it's not exclusively a Pentecostal thing, I don't think, but it's obviously very largely associated mm. with mm. it. Mm. Um, how has, what role has that had in the uh, creation of theology, would you say? Well, it's had really two roles, I would say. Um, on the one hand, um, some of the major denominations of Pentecostalism would see speaking with tongues as a marker of baptism in the spirit mm. and that might sound rather um, rather rather um, contentious but actually what it does is it produces a biblical marker for a religious experience so rather than seeking all kinds of other markers that marker becomes the defining marker of that experience so, so you, you, you tie the experience to the marker of speaking with tongues. So Assemblies of God would argue that this is the initial evidence of the baptism in the Spirit. Whereas other groups, and particularly charismatic groups, would not wish to have that marker and would wish to say, well, there are lots of markers of mm -hmm. the baptism in the Spirit, not just that one. So if it's something that you don't do or you can't do, it doesn't matter? It doesn't matter. If a charismatic... But it, within the Assemblies of God, it would matter. Yeah, yeah, yes. I, uh, it, 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 certainly traditionally, although sometimes you might think that it's these days it doesn't matter. But in, in mm -hmm. certainly originally it was it does. E theoretically it does. And and and. Uh, but actually, uh, we've had done studies on this with Pentecostal denominations, and what's happened is that speaking with tongues is seen actually as a devotional matter, a matter of prayer. So people speaking tongues in their private prayers. And that's seen as, as part of their own devotional life, uh, rather than as a marker of a particular religious experience. I see. And in terms of um, sort of 2,000 years of theology in the church before Pentecostalism emerges uh, towards the end of the 19th, early 20th century, what, what role does, is that seen as having? Is that seen as being really something that's a bit peripheral or something which is kind of embraced within the Pentecostal understanding of what Christianity is? I would say it's deeply paradoxical in, in the sense that on the one hand, Pentecostals want to argue that we start again with day one when people speak in tongues and this is completely new and we, 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 we begin with a blank sheet of paper and on the other hand, they want to say this has happened before in, in the New Testament and in the early church and we're simply going back to the early church and trying to, to bring the early church into the 21st century or the 20th century. So on the one hand, they want to, to, to say tradition doesn't matter. On the other hand, they want the support of tradition. Yes. So it, it, it's all too easy in that situation to kind of zoom through. It's like one of those lifts that takes you from the ground floor up to the, the 50th you know, um, without stopping at any of the intervening flaws um, to sort of zoom through from the New Testament world to the present kind of... Um. There, there is, although, I mean, Pentecostals subsequently went back 
tracked over church history and found examples of, you know, the Montanists would be an example or the Jansenists right. would be an example. Yes. So interesting um, characters who uh, yeah, went yeah. against the grain in various ways. Yes, yes, and they would see these. They, so they would see these as a sort of forebears. I mean, the be the best known person is is Irving, um, who who preaches um, in in eighteen thirty. Um, and he preaches in, in London and he does have people speaking in tongues in his church. And so he was often seen as a, a kind of forerunner of Pentecostalism, if you like, the Jan Hus of the Reformation, as it were, the, the, uh, the early right. version. Um, Interesting, yes, a proto. Mm, prototype. Yeah. Prototype. Mm. William, thank you very much. That was a very helpful introduction to Pentecostal theology. Thank you. Mm.